Mm. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Melissa Levine, and I am the director of the Copyright Office at the University of Michigan Library. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the IFLA uh, Advisory Committee on Copyright and Other Legal Matters. And IFLA is, of course, the International Federation of Library Associations. Um, it is not the International Federation of Landscape Architects, which I also is having an annual meeting that's showing up in many people's search engines. Um, uh, our committee put together a book uh, published in 2020, excuse me, in, in 2022 called Navigating Copyright for Libraries. And we're spending some time talking to some of the editors and, uh, and authors of different chapters um, uh, to discuss the book and uh, why people put it together, uh, how it addresses copyright, and um, how they could use it. And so I have the pleasure of being here today with my friend, Jessica Coates. Uh, we met in another life, another copyright-related life, working on the Right Statements project. Um, Jessica served as one of the co-editors, along with Susan Riley and Victoria Owen. And she also contributed uh, a chapter, a fairly significant chapter called Fundamentals of Moder Modern Copyright. Um, Jessica is the Senior Rights Advisor at the National Library of Australia. She earned her Master's in Law at the University of Melbourne, and she lives in Canberra. Uh, she has served as the Executive Officer of the Australian Digital Alliance, as the Copyright Law and Policy Advisor for the Australian Library's Copyright Committee, and as the global network manager for Creative Commons. So she has quite a span, um, both globally, but particularly in and of Australia. Um, before we started recording, Jessica, we were talking about your work with the IFLA Advisory Committee on Copyright and Legal Matters, we say, say CLM. Um, how, tell me about your involvement with IFLA before we talk about the book. Uh, well, I first got involved with CLM back in 2015, when I was working for the Australian Libraries, Archives and Copyright Committee, which I'll just call ELAC. Um, so when I was working for ELAC, um, I had the privilege of representing Australia essentially on the committee um, for several years. And since then, I've been a really active member because I really enjoy the, you know, being part of the committee and I really respect um, uh, what, you know, it's trying to do. Um, and I'm also a very, um, uh, you know, frequent participant at Board Library Congress. It's my favorite conference to go to each year. I, I've I just been and to I my present. Yeah, you try to present. It's it just I've just been to my first last summer. So and it is was an amazing experience. Um, so turning to the book, um, you both authored a chapter and you served as editor. So first, what was your motivation for serving as an editor? Um, we the. The committee had been talking about it for a while. Uh, we needed, you know, people to do it. And basically kind of me, Victoria and Susan were the ones who were willing to step up. Um, it's uh, uh, Sorry, it had been in somebody else's hands before. Uh, and, um, sorry, and we needed people to take it on. Um, I am a chronic overcommitter and I do like doing, um, uh, having kind of some kind of extra activity that kind of keeps me going. It was a really great experience to get to, you know, look at all these amazing uh, chapters by different people all over the world and keep up with what's going on and talking about at the moment. Um, so as a chapter author, um, you cover a lot of ground in what I think you, th you said when we were preparing that you felt it was long, but I think it covers an awful lot in a fairly short number of pages. Um, and that I could actually like build a course around it. Um, and that's true actually of many of the chapters in the book. Um, when you think about what you were aiming at or what you would want for this, how do you envision either your chapter or the book in general being used? Like what kind of audience? Well, the book in general was supposed, is intended to be um really aimed at the library professionals, I would say, or somebody else with an interest in it. And it was trying to gather together a combination of the fundamentals that you need to know um, as a librarian around the world um, to try to 
really ensure because such different countries have such different positions in terms of copyright law and libraries exceptions and things like that. It was partly about ensuring that people could see what was happening in different countries and kind of create an equal um, knowledge base for everybody in the world. Uh, but then at the same time as having that kind of fundamentals, it was also about trying to highlight the hot issues and prepare librarians for um, the ability to participate in the copyright space and, um, you know, advocate for their own rights within their um, country and, uh, you know, sort of be able to advise the people they're working with on um, where to go next um, on in the copyright space. So professionals in particular, people already in the field, students? Students, definitely. Anybody who's interested, obviously, in library copyright. But primarily it's about um, people who want to see better exceptions for libraries around the world and better engagement uh, in the space. Libraries have, copyright is such a big thing for libraries, and there's always a subset of libraries and librarians who are very active, but there are lots that are really just left out in the cold by, you know, their own country's legislation or by the amount of, you know, the advocacy that goes on um, from in other spaces. So it's really about empowering people, anybody in who wants to represent the library sector uh, in the copyright discussion. It's, it's interesting because the, one of the themes that runs through your whole chapter is this issue of balance. And you don't, you don't talk about this as balance and imbalance. You just emphasize balance, but the, it's more than subtext is that it's not, it's not balanced. And um, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Positioning? So I am a copyright geek. I really do love copyright. I have been in the space for you know, 25 years or so now. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, but, and. Getting uh, seasoned. Yes, that's <laughs> it. I'm very seasoned. Um, but I'm very much, um, I come very much from a strong background of the library sector and creative commons and the idea that copyright is um, designed to create a large pool of knowledge that everyone can access. I think that is what copyright is for. And uh, I don't think anybody would really debate that, but I feel that in the discussion that goes on about copyright reform and copyright advocacy, the focus in that discussion becomes on this idea of motivating creators to create by in giving them rights to control their copyright and allowing them to remunerate. Um, so essentially strengthening copyright rights of rights holders. And what often gets forgotten is the very the essential balance to that, which is ensuring that the material is accessible and usable by everybody else. It's, uh, you know, there's not many people who argue for perpetual copyright, but the few people who do, like, the, what is the point of having, you know, Shakespeare and, uh, you know, Captain Cook's diaries uh, protected by copyright so that they can't legally be used without a permission? Who are you going to get permission from? That kind of thing. Um, and that's an extreme examples, but it moves into very modern things. What is the point of not letting people quote from other things? You can't share knowledge. You can't learn. You can't um, guide others. You can't participate in, you know, public debate unless you can at least make some use without having to go through the very cumbersome permissions process. Um, and I really do think that the fundamental purpose of copyright is to create a very big public domain, is to ensure that some materials created that will eventually become free for everybody to use. And so that has def that's definitely, that was my uh, total text, not subtext, um, in writing this chapter, is to try to try to in include that fundamental understanding as a baseline for the book as well and everybody else. So there were two, two aspects really. One was just to ensure that there was the actual purpose for the chapter, the real base, uh, basic explanation is um, that we needed to have a chapter that explained how copyright worked for those people who don't have great copyright knowledge. They might be amazing professional librarians, they might be students, but they don't have the breadth of copyright knowledge that the authors have. Uh, and it was, was used to have a chapter that just was basically a copyright primer uh, so that everybody was on the same position. But as part of that primer, I also wanted to imbue this message that I was talking about and base the whole um, book's 
philosophy, philosophy around the, uh, the importance of sharing and accessible in the public domain rather than just the copyright as a tool for locking things up, copyright as a tool for creating an opportunity. It's interesting because it's understandable for it's understandable that lawyers who represent clients, artists, mm -hmm. industry, whatever, would be focusing on asserting the rights. And it was only in the last decade or so, which is, and I've been in this maybe longer than you, um, but that thinking about the public domain as just as important, which is exactly what you were saying before we started this, is, is just as much in a legitimate and critical piece that it doesn't actually get emphasized in other creative sectors in the same way. So. That's right. And I feel like the library sector has always been saying that to a certain degree, has always been saying, we have to at least be up to learning books. No, um, but, um, you know, in the history of copyright advocacy around the world, particularly in the large Western countries with a lot of money and stuff, um, but actually, no, honestly, in all the countries, um, uh, that the library's voice was, it was very easy for it to get lost um, in a lot of the earlier debates because there was much louder voices from companies like you know, Hollywood and, you know, people who actually have money, Hollywood and record labels and stuff like that. And then we had the internet revolution and finally there were voices on the other side um, in terms of tech companies who also wanted it to be open. But it was obviously uh, not ideal. Like, um, the library voice was still there. Um, it was joined by the tech voices, but uh, the tech voices had, you know, have some controversy around them and uh, people question their motives. Though I should point out the motives of big business on the other side are probably pretty similar. Um, and so I feel like the libraries are the solid base that has always been there. And it's the more that we can empower that voice and the schools, library, school, disability groups, the more we can empower those voices to be able to join the discussion and uh, be listened to and be heard, the better yeah, it's, the legislation is going to be, the more balanced it's going to be. Right. It's, it's important to show up. It's important to know what you're talking about because um, that's just, it's just really, it's important. Um so one of the things about the public domain, and you discuss this in your chapter, is the way in which we have an international treaty that helps set a baseline for countries that participate in that, which is most most countries, but that cop but the duration varies by different countries. And um, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about that or thoughts actually, I'm actually really curious to um about your thoughts in the way that Australia is unique? Um, Regarding so, copyright, not everything. Yes. <laughs> not everything Australia. Um, um, well, you know. Um, that would be big. Our are amazing. I mean, <laughs> sorry. Um, but um, uh, in terms of the public domain, I'm sorry, in, yeah, in terms of copyright duration, mm -hmm. um, I do think it is one of the saddest things that has happened in copyright. Um, policy in the last, I don't know how long you want to count it, 50 or 100 years, that copyright duration kept being extended over and over again. So it became very long. I certainly don't, I certainly agree with copyright last year, at least life of the author, so the authors have control and probably a bit longer than that. But the idea that it kept being extended just basically for the interests of um, large corporations uh, and to the detriment of the public domain and to the detriment of users. Um, and the reason why that's a really big problem is because, of course, 99% of material that's ever produced and covered by copyright, because copyright is automatic, it's so, uh, it sucks everything, it is so all engrossing. 99% um, of those things have no value at the point of the end of their copyright, but you still can't legally use them. Um, and so extending copyright gives a windfall to a very small number of already generally wealthy um, groups and doesn't really, and only, and then adds cost to almost everybody else. Um, so it was really disappointing to see it continuously extended. Having said that, it was very exciting to see recent, that there hasn't been a push for that extension in the US in the last few years when we saw Mickey Mouse's copyright coming to Steamboat Willie's copyright coming to an end. We were all wondering if there was going to be another push. It's not just it's a lot of people, but um uh it's a good 
timeline and it didn't happen. And I really do think that's due to what you talked about, that in the last decade, the public conversation has moved on a lot, that has become much more aware of the importance of the public domain. Um, the push by people like Lawrence Lessig, you know, taking to court to try to actually overturn the US extension was a really good start. Um, and groups like Creative Commons, but also, and, you know, and the library sector, of course. But also, I think the growth of the internet and the fact that people do understand why you might re need to reuse material. Like it, it's in your everyday life nowadays, a lot more than people did, you know, uh, in the 1990s, you know, in the 1990s, you know, you, make, you might make mixtapes and that was about it. And now people really understand how valuable it can be to reuse material. Copyrights moved into the living room, which is a bit disappointing uh, from one point of view. We might've all been better off when we didn't have to know about copyright. But on the plus side, uh, it has made people more aware of the importance of the balance in the public domain. So I feel like, I hope anyway, that at the moment the pendulum is swinging more towards uh, um, increasing the balance and allowing, uh, you know, ensuring that we do protect the knowledge for everybody um, and away from um, just enriching, you know, already rich corporations. So I have a really practical question, which is... Um... It's really hard work to write yes. and it's, it's really, um, it takes more time than you ever think it will. And it seems like it's going to be easy up front and then it is painful. Like how long, how did you approach the writing? Um, like, I don't want to discourage people from doing it at all. Um, but I don't what, know that I can say that I had, we had a typical experience with this book because uh, we really hit the ground and started to get up authors on board late in 2019, uh, you know, about October, November 2019, I reckon was about the time when we really had uh, authors aligned uh, and then COVID happened. So most of this book, it took much longer than we had intended it to, you know, we were all talking about a year um, for drafting and things like that. But in fact, it really did take two and a half, you know, uh, it took to the end of the COVID period, uh, the main COVID period, um, uh, to get it done because everybody just everything was thrown up in the air and went crazy and you had you know some people who had more time to write and you know some authors were able to get their work in more easily while others uh, you know sort of you know their lives were totally insane and or they were actually sick and things like that um, in terms of me I was a single mother with a kid who had homeschool <laughs> um, but at the same time I couldn't go out in the evening so um I think working for non-profits for so long, you do develop quite a, you know, and also I did a master's whilst working full time. So I already had a, you know, a good habit of, uh, you know. Did you see my eye roll? I just did a big, like, that's a lot. <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry. I was, I did my master's before the book, I should say. Okay. That's still book. a lot. <laughs> but yeah, so I've, um, I've, uh, so I've got experience. It's, it was about finding time around the edge, a bit of a binge writer. So, um, you know, a few really heavy weekends, um, but also I can't, uh, I can't lie, it was material that I knew. So it's, it's based on the kind of um, education I've been doing for the library sectors for a very long time. So I always knew what the outline was. Probably the biggest effort for me was trying to make sure that it was a bit more balanced because I am Australian. I do come from the common law tradition. Um, I'm very much imbued in that. And so trying to make sure there was a bit more acknowledgement of the civil law and uh and raise it up to the international level to ensure that um, it wasn't just, though I, I'm pretty sure it's still very common law biased, um, but extra research around that was really fun. It was the fun part, but it was, you know, the complicated part. One of the most important things for me in, in participating in IFLA and CLM in particular is that even when you're involved with copyright for a really long time and you understand your own country, and you think you understand, at least have scaffolding of how it works in other countries. The truth is, even when we're speaking like English or French, like we're, we're speaking the same language, I think it's sort of like culturally sufficiently different that it takes more effort to really understand and internalize different the differences yeah. um, because they do come from culture. And history so much. Um, uh, I think it is also really exciting that this book was published open access. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, yes. you know, it seems very aligned with everything you've been describing about your own approach to things. Um, what uh, is, is, we can tidy this up, but what, what if there were like other things you wanted to talk about, is there anything we didn't hit? I did. I wanted to answer your question about Australia because I realized. I oh, oh, good. Okay. Do that. Um, which was um, in terms of what Australia is a bit different from the rest of the world, or and maybe not everybody, but um, so Australia uh, doesn't have a tr- uh, fair use exception. It has fair dealings, but it doesn't have a very broad, flexible um, fair use exception. But what it does have instead is a lot of a lot of specific exceptions and um, some very good exceptions for the library sector, and uh, including something that is essentially fair use for libraries. We call it the flexible dealing exception. It's a little bit complex how it's written because it's based on the three-step test. For everybody who's copyright geek, they'll know what I mean. Um, But um, uh, essentially, since 2005, the Australian library sector has really been empowered to be able to take a very strong kind of flexible risk management approach to how they present their material and it's really it's been an amazing experience it's really let us push the boundaries um, of uh, what we can do not what's reasonable I think that you know most libraries can't reach the brand under their law can't reach the boundaries of what everybody thinks is reasonable it's really let us um, really try to get to that edge of reasonable use by libraries and Activities like Trove and things like that. Um, uh, for those who don't know, that's the live, that's the uh, central catalogue for all the um, glam sector, the libraries, culture, museums in Australia. That um, and it's an online, uh, and also it presents a lot of online materials that way. It's a giant source of material. We have like billions of newspapers, for instance, called the History of Australia, all available for free to read on Trove up to 1955. Um, anyway, uh, the point is it's allowed a lot of really amazing experimentation and pushing boundaries. And uh, we a lot of that's related to risk management. Um, and I think it, that's the kind of approach that we really need to um, empower for the rest of the library sector around the world, really enable um, the ability to make reasonable decisions about your collection without being afraid of copyright law, to be able to take risks um, and uh, I really would love to see us be able to get there. And that's something Australia is really privileged to have. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, the discussion of these things tends towards this conversation about risk management. Mm-hmm. And I used to frame it that way, but I actually now think of it as part of the stewardship. Mm-hmm. And I like that framing better because it it reinforces the way in which we're trying to make mission-driven decisions that are aligned with what the public thinks we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. We think we're supposed to be doing and it's, it's not, it shouldn't be about risk. It should be about like, we have like, there are rights that are sort of embodied in the things that we purchase and license and so forth. We want to be respectful of those things, but it's also, it's a bigger, I think, I think you laid it out really nicely. And Um, I do think COVID um, did, uh, open again, open up people's eyes a bit more to how important this is. So I hope we're in a good place in terms of things you mm-hmm. And also what's possible. But yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, it was excellent talking. Bye.